Hi, everyone. Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. After years of federal protections, wolves are now being hunted again in several states. And so how does that affect other animal populations? And is hunting the right course of action? Thankfully, we're going to talk to a couple of experts today. Uh, John Vucetich, who is a PhD, a distinguished professor, a professor at Michigan Tech, who has been studying wolves for most of his adult life, and his name lends itself so well to his profession. Maybe he can explain that a little bit later. And Amanda White, who is program manager for wildlife protection at the Humane Society of the United States. Thank you both for sitting down here to chat with us today. Thank you so much for having us. Oh, yeah, it's, it's great to be here. You bet. John, what uh, can you explain? Uh, you were explaining a little bit before the episode started. I thought it was so cool. Carrie and I just, uh, we needed to repeat it here on the episode, what your name means. Sure. So my name, as you as you had mentioned, is uh, John Vucetich. It's a Croatian name. And the, and the root to the word, if you get rid of the suffix at the end, is, is Vuk, V-U-K. And uh, it's, a, it's a Bulgarian word, and, and in other Eastern European languages, it's a word that means wolf. And so it would seem as though I was predetermined to uh, to have the path that I that I currently have absolutely <laughs> destined yeah yeah right hope you use that on interviews you're like it's in my name so can <laughs> I get the job <laughs> that's Austin, right this is an interview <laughs> yeah yes right right clearly right. he just, does yeah 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 <laughs> Um, well, John, thank you. And Amanda, really, really appreciate you coming back for um, another episode here on the podcast. John, to start us off, can you give us a bit of background as to why these protections have been lifted and, and what are the reasons that some people are saying that killing wolves is necessary, if, if those are even accurate? Right. You know, when, when people are making arguments for why it is that they want to hunt wolves, usually it's three things or one of three things that they're drawing on. And they all end up being bad reasons for, for hunting wolves. Uh, people are concerned that wolves are a threat to wild prey like deer and elk. And this just simply isn't true. For sure, wolves prey on those species, but that's not a, a threat to those populations of deer or elk. It's not a threat to opportunities to hunt. Idaho is having some of its most amazing hunting seasons that they've ever seen, all in the presence of wolves. Second reason that people sometimes offer for wanting to hunt wolves is that they kill livestock. It is the case that wolves sometimes very rarely kill livestock. From an industry perspective, from the, from the perspective of the cattle ranching industry, the amount that wolves kill livestock is literally a rounding error. It's that rare. Mm -hmm. Now, for sure, when if you're the livestock owner and if it's your livestock that's been killed by wolves, that's a big deal. And, and, uh, and we should find a way to manage that problem and to even compensate a person who's experienced a loss like that. But there's a great deal of science that it all suggests that hunting wolves is very simply not a sensible way to, to deal with that problem at all. The, the last reason that people sometimes offer for wanting to hunt wolves is, is, is the worst uh, because of how untrue it is, which is basically that, that wolves are a danger to humans. It's, it's, it's not true. Um, wolves are, are just simply not a danger to humans. If there was ever a case where there was a threatening situation between a wolf and a human, man, you would want to deal with that problem immediately anyways. You wouldn't wait till the next upcoming hunting season and hope some hunter has the good fortune of of, of uh, taking care of the wolf that was causing, causing the trouble. So um, so those are the reasons. They're all bad reasons. And it, it, it leaves me with the basic idea, which is it shouldn't kill anything without a good reason. And really, no one has ever offered a good reason for, for hunting wolves. I'm curious, and this is maybe a question for both of y'all. When you see these sort of issues with wolves come up in policy, is this something that sort of happens cyclically? cyclically? Like, is it sort of like we go through a period where people where this this push to 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 deal with the wolf issue by killing comes up repeatedly and then is kind of pushed back and then it comes up again and is is there usually something that drives those those sort of cycles if so i think um i think a lot of it has to do with whether they're protected under the endangered species act mm -hmm. or not when they are then we kind of see everything cool down a little more and when they're not then we see these states really try to ramp up uh, hunting them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would add maybe one thing to that. First of all, I think what Amanda said is, is spot on. 
I think that, um, of course, we've seen in the state of Wisconsin and in the state of Idaho, particularly in, in relatively re recent months even, um, uh, a kind of zealotry to, to, to really kill wolves in a way that hadn't been seen before. I, I think that some of that bad behavior actually was brought on by the by the previous presidential administration. I think that the previous administration just made it easier for people to express certain forms of hatred. And, mm. and that's really what we're dealing with here is hatred against wolves and really nothing less than that. And so I think that may have made this more most recent cycle a little bit more intense. Well, quite a bit more intense, actually. Interesting. I mean, it, it's like, do you see this sort of hatred of a particular species? Do you see it play out in other in other areas? Or is there something kind of unique about people's relationships with wolves over time? You know, I, 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 for better and for worse, mm. uh, wolves are special, and mm. they their their specialness to humans is partly reflected in their mythologies and our mythologies about them, uh, yeah. and they, they figure into everything from Little Red Riding Hood to the fact that uh, Rome was founded by Romulus and Remus who were suckled mm. by a, a wolf. And so um, all things that we love about nature and all the things that we hate about nature all are born by wolves. None of it's really fair because mm. wolves are amazing creatures without any of that mythology. And uh, so, yeah, they, they carry that extra burden for sure in a way that many other species don't. Mm. I was thinking just this morning about like, you know, when I was thinking about wolf mythology, like the first thing that came to my mind was the three little pigs. And then I was like, you know, it's really ironic because really, if you think about what's a threat to pigs, it's people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's be clear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, um, no, for sure. Uh, it, just on the thing about what it is that we're afraid of sometimes, in, you know, in the upper Midwest, where I live in, in Michigan, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are injured and killed when they hit deer with their cars. Mm -hmm. If you want to be afraid of an animal, my goodness, a white-tailed deer when you're behind the wheel is, is I mean, it's demonstrably more dangerous than, than wolves ever will be. And, uh, and of course, if, if, if wolves were, are allowed to perform their ecological functions, there'd be not so many deer on the on the highways ready to be hit let's get those natural habitat bridges going over the highways yeah, exactly. come on please and, try, and just drive slower and, and oh, break yeah, you know that, yeah that's true. <laughs> yeah that's a better idea um well we're talking yeah i like that we brought up the mythology a little bit about wolves uh, amanda can we talk about the the reality what are wolves like personality wise and kind of the characteristics that we have uh surrounding wolves yeah, especially given that they've got this sort of, you know, caricature of wolves yeah. as these snarling beast, beast like, I mean, like, you know, I remember when I was a kid that this has been so exaggerated in human consciousness that we, I had a friend that we, we used to listen to that, um, the, the symphony of Peter and the Wolf, and whenever mm. they would play that wolf theme, which I don't know if you guys know this symphony, but it's an incredibly threatening piece of music that's like, Da, na, 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 na. and my friend and I would actually go hide in the closet because we were so terrified and when I think about that now it's like this associating that with wolves is so crazy once you know about them yeah they are so shy there was a article in I think it was USA Today on their website yesterday about these hikers in Yellowstone and they were so focused on you know looking at the ground and making sure that they weren't tripping that they completely missed that they had surprised this wolf pack just like 20 yards away from them. And these other wildlife watchers caught it all on film. And you see the wolf, they said before they started filming, the wolf noticed the hikers walking right past him and he jumped up and hid behind a tree. <laughs> and you see them run away. So yeah, they're so shy and elusive mm. and um, have such individual playful personalities and they're so social. Um, they have rich family lives and I'd love to hear John's thoughts more. I feel like most of what I've learned about wolves' personalities and social lives have come from books and articles that he and others have written. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, you know, a, a little uh, a story that just uh, kind of uh, reinforces the thoughts that Amanda was sharing. So it, it really is one of my favorite experiences on Isle Royale. I was there, which is where I do much of my field work. It's an island in Lake Superior. And um, I was there very early in the season. There were, I don't know, maybe a dozen people on the entire island. And then, of course, the population of wolves. I was doing my field work, hiking down the trail. The trail was muddy, so I was leaving boot, boot prints everywhere I went. And at the end of the day, I was walking back. And uh, perfectly superimposed in my boot print, uh, going in the opposite direction was a wolf track. Wow. And um, 
And I just appreciated it so much because that wolf very likely was just as in the story that Amanda was sharing, that wolf very likely was just sitting in the in the forest just off the trail, probably completely aware of what I was doing. And of course, I have no idea that it was even there were it not for the footprint. And and um, you know, that that really is number one, a good proper relationship between wolves mm. and, and humans. They're doing their thing and I'm doing my thing uh, in the very same place. And uh, and of course, that's that's the most common uh, common kind of relationship when uh, when wolves and humans are allowed to coexist. And that it's a really good point, too, because you don't you don't necessarily run it. You know, you're not running across packs of wolves when you're going out hiking and doing that stuff because they are so shy they're usually they're doing their own thing they're trying to get their life going and not interfere or interact with uh other humans or uh, other things I, it's funny um i just heard carrie a this is not a wolf story but it's it's a bobcat story but i feel like it relates amy jesse was out and she had encountered a bobcat and the population was so dense in where she was living but she's like yeah i've lived there for how many years now and this is the very first time i've gone hiking almost every weekend that i saw one bobcat mm -hmm. and that's what i think is a story with a lot i feel like it translates with wolves too when are you coming across all the time huge populations of wolves maybe mm -hmm. in the tracks john like you were saying but i don't know not seeing them on a daily basis so yeah no, you're you're so right about that, and, and this speaks to really. Um, I mean, this is a misconception that a lot of wildlife managers have about how to relate to nature. You know, Wisconsin, who, who of course has been misbehaving so greatly about wanting to hunt so many wolves, mm -hmm. a, a lot of that fervor for hunting wolves, not all of it, but a lot of it is tied to a belief that there ought to be a certain number of wolves in the state mm -hmm. of Wisconsin, the number 300 or 350 sometimes shows up. And uh, man, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what the number is. What matters is, uh, is a wolf causing trouble? If it's causing trouble, let's figure out how to solve the trouble. If they're not causing trouble, just let it be. And, and, and you, quite frankly, you don't need to know how many wolves there are to, right. to, that seems to, to manage that. It's an arbitrary thing. Like, how do they even get to those numbers? Like, that that's just so strange. I mean, is, is it based on some sort of, like, population balances between wolves and livestock? Or what's the argument there? You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural thing. Mm. Uh, amongst wildlife managers. And it, I think it originally is born from an innocent place, but then it just doesn't get properly developed. And mm. it's that wildlife managers are quite properly taught to count things and mm. it's hard <laughs> to count things. And so you do it well and you spend a lot of time thinking about it. And by golly, if you're going to do all that counting, there must be some numbers that are better than others. And then you just kind of go from there. <laughs> and uh, of course, while all the counting is just fine, uh, the, the obsession with controlling that number is the part where, where managers often... Uh, get it maybe not quite right and uh, and, the, and the other thing is that most uh, wildlife managers the primary training is is uh, in the science of the animals in the way that we're speaking which is the, the better way to think of it which is to just is there a problem and if there's a problem let's manage the problem well now this has got a lot more to do with people with humans mm -hmm. than it does with the wolves themselves and 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 while things are changing rapidly for wildlife managers in terms of training uh they they still lag behind in the training for just uh understanding how to how to manage um humans basically mm -hmm. we're we're actually much more difficult to manage than than, than wolves <laughs> yeah yeah, I was curious. I mean, when Austin was asking, you know, like you don't you don't frequently encounter a bunch of wolf packs um, when you're out. And I mean, I, I was wondering, I mean, just just out of curiosity, is that is that true everywhere? I mean, are there places I mean, I was actually until pretty recently surprised um, to find that there were wolves in Wisconsin, because I, I typically think of wolves as being sort of a great West phenomenon, like, you know, the sweeping plains, mountains, etc. And so I was actually surprised and happy to find out that wolves were still in places like that, because my impression has been and we've we've done so much damage to their populations already and i'm curious like are they still in a lot of the country how many places are they still are there still wolf populations oh in the in the lower 48 uh wolves occupy gray wolves in particular occupy about 15 percent of their former range so, mm. so so they they would have lived again just speaking about the lower 48 basically everywhere except for the southeastern portion of the mm. united states mm -hmm. And where they're at now, so we're still talking about gray wolves now, where they're at now is uh, the Northern Rockies, which is primarily the states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, and then the Upper Great Lakes, which is primarily Minnesota, Michigan, and Wisconsin. 
a few wolves in Oregon and Washington. Mm. And then there's also wolves. It's, sorry, it gets so complicated. There's also Mexican wolves. They're different subspecies, though, and they're in Arizona and New Mexico. And there's just a handful of them in the wild. And then there's red wolves, again, different subspecies. And there's precious few of them in, in, uh, in, in the Carolinas. And so, uh, so but to, to recap the essential part, what's most important for our conversation now, I think, is that uh, wolves only occupy about 15% of the places that they used to live. Mm. And that, that's that's we can do better than that. We really can. And with these thinning populations, what effect does that have on the balance of biodiversity within the lower 48 or the regions that we're discussing? Well, there's there's two or three ways to answer that question. The, the first way is to, is to appreciate that a, a food web or an ecosystem uh, is uh, pretty connected. And so, and wolves do have this position right at the top of this of food web or the food chain, however you like to describe it. They tend to eat large ungulates. So that's animals like deer and elk. Deer and elk are pretty abundant and they eat the vegetation. And, and in the forest, if you're talking about deer and grasslands, if you're talking about elk, and when you have a creature that's that abundant, elk and deer, and when what they do is eat the vegetation, well, I mean, that makes tons of changes um, for all kinds of creatures. Mm. And so this can spill over to affecting uh, bird populations, small mammal populations, the other kinds of lesser common plant species that are available. And so you can trace the effect of wolves through quite a few different species. So that's, that's the sciencey answer. But I, I do think that um, the sciencey answer is um, is one that's subject to critique because I can describe the effect of wolves and a different scientist very well qualified could say, well, I don't think the effect is quite that great. And they might have a point to make. And then we'd have to kind of argue through that and see what's going on with, well, what actually is the effect of wolves? And here's what's most important to me is that the reason to be good to wolves has nothing to do with what they do in the ecosystem. They're creatures that have their own interests, that have their own lives, and they should be treated as such. And it doesn't matter if they have a big impact or not. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's so important is because if we attach the value of wolves to something that we think they do in the ecosystem, well, what if science later on shows that they don't quite have that effect? I mean, that's mm. entirely plausible. And so anyways, so if the question is, what is it that wolves do in the ecosystem? First answer, it doesn't matter. Mm. <laughs> they, they should be treated properly be before we get into that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, they're, they're amazing creatures. They have a disproportionate influence on their ecosystems. There's, there's no doubt about that. So in terms of like debates over, over the management of wolves, you know, like where are the sort of different parties coming from? I mean, are, are hunters all sort of aligned around, around the idea of killing wolves? Are there particular parties that, that really, you know, want to take these bad management practices in, an, in the stronger direction? I mean, it just seems like the, this war on wolves has gotten so much more intense just recently. Sure. You know, um, hunters are like, all groups of humans, they're not all the same. You know, they mm -hmm. come in different stripes yeah. and flavors and kinds. And um, it's my impression and understanding from talking to hunters and from speaking to um, scientists who study hunting attitudes, um, you know, the interest to hunt wolves is not nearly as great as it's made out to be. Most hunters are primarily interested in, in sustenance. They're mm. primarily interested in, in hunting for the meat that one gets. And so this means primarily we're talking about hunting things like um, uh, uh, white-tailed deer and elk and creatures like this. So, you know, when, when a hunter has to think about why am I doing this, hunting one animal or another, they know that they don't eat the meat from a wolf. And so... So it doesn't leave a lot of reasons for why you would hunt wolves. And the mm. reason that keeps concerning me is that it's simply done out of hatred. And, the, and, and not that many people would just admit straightforwardly that, hey, the reason I want to hunt a wolf is because of hatred. But when you listen to the reasons that are offered for why they do want to hunt, and we talked about those a little bit earlier in the program, livestock and, and wild prey and uh, human safety. And when those 
reasons for hunting wolves are so easily and demonstrably shown to be false Mm. you're left with the only remaining answer that it must be because that they that they hate wolves and now long ago in our american history we attempted to exterminate wolves entirely Mm. there were bounties on wolves we weren't interested in a recreational hunt on wolves we we wanted to exterminate them Mm. and we were basically successful in the lower 48 and so but we're we're past that hopefully and and so what we're trying to do now in the early 21st century is trying to develop a new relationship with wolves and one of the tragic possible outcomes is that we're deciding some states are deciding that this new relationship is that we want to hunt them because we hate them. America has a rich hunting tradition, uh, but never have we decided that we want to recreationally hunt something because we hated it. I and mean, we've never done that. If, if we move down that road, man, that will be a stain on America's hunting tradition that will not go away quickly at all. And, and it really is coming from a tiny majority of hunters. They have a loud voice and they're being listened to by state governments. And, um, and I don't know why that state governments don't listen to the broader constituency has a much more sensible view on the matter, but they're, they're listening to just a few people. Mm. Yeah. And I'll just add, you know, we, it's definitely a minority of Mm -hmm. hunters we've seen in um, earlier this year, Montana and Idaho passed some really terrible wolf laws. And we saw quite a few hunters come out and testify against those bills. And for the exact reasons that John was saying that, um, you know, that they just don't find trophy hunting, um, ethical or the mm-hmm. methods that are used to hunt wolves ethical. Um, and there was even a group in Wisconsin that formed earlier this year called Hunters for Wolves um, mm-hmm. that have been putting up billboards that say real hunters don't kill wolves. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've definitely been seeing a lot of hunters speaking out this year, which has That's been great. nice. Yeah. Yeah, that is really wonderful. And and Amanda, thank you for giving a little bit uh, more of context about what's going on, um, you know, federal legislation wise. I know that there's been a lot of debate, as Carrie was saying, between the past two presidential administrations. Um, You were mentioning a little bit, but where are we currently in terms of the the regulations? I know it's different from state to state and also federally, but um, what's the temperature that we're at right now? Yeah, there has been a lot going on, so Mm -hmm. I'll try to be brief without going too far into the weeds. Um, But yeah, since the early 2000s, the government has repeatedly tried to delist wolves. Um, Wolves in Idaho and Montana actually lost their federal protections back in uh, 2011 through an act of Congress, and wolves in Wyoming lost theirs in 2017. Uh, And those states were pretty quick to open up trophy hunting and trapping seasons. Um, Most recently, the Trump administration delisted wolves uh, in the lower 48, and that decision went into effect in January of this year. Uh, So HSUS um, and our allies are currently in court trying to overturn that decision. Uh, That case is still moving along. We have a hearing coming up on November 12th. Uh, And then at the same time, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, earlier this year in Idaho and Montana, they passed some laws that drastically increased the number of wolves that can be killed. Um, Under the new laws, I think it's up to 90% of Idaho's wolf population and up to 85% of Montana's could be wiped out through these new laws. Uh, So as a result, we and our allies uh, petitioned the Fish and Wildlife Service for both permanent and emergency relisting of wolves in the Northern Rockies. And last month, the service responded to our petition um, and announced that relisting might be warranted. Um, So they opened a formal status review. Uh, That process takes a long time, though. uh, So we're still pushing for emergency relisting in the meantime. Um, But we were glad to see that development. Yeah, that's great. Just out of curiosity, I mean, in terms of that that process, in terms of opening the period for review is there are there things that sort of our listeners can do to get involved in that process I mean is it a public comment period what is it absolutely yeah there's a public comment period that's open now um I don't know are we able to include a link in the the show notes or something like that I'm happy to send that around Yeah. yeah no it's it's good to hear because you know as listeners we're like what what are the things that we can do on on an everyday basis so so that's really helpful 
Um, John, you, you have a book titled Restoring the Balance, What Wolves Tell Us About Our Relationship with Nature. Um, you know, as a, as a word that we can kind of think and end the episode with, can you tell us some of the mo most important lessons that you're finding from this book in your decades of studying wolves and things that we should, you know, keep in mind with our coexistence with these animals that have been around for a very long time? Oh my gosh. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I have been, as, as you mentioned, I've been studying wolves for my entire adult life for 30 years now, much of it on a place called Isle Royal National Park, which is an island in Lake Superior. And, you know, over the years, you know, these uh, reflections and observations have been kind of building and accumulating and they were uh, taking up a little too much space in my mind. They needed to be let out. And so I let them out into this book. And um, the, the book is, um, is a variety of perspectives and kinds of writing. Some of it is um, just good old natural history, history writing about what the life of a wolf and a moose is all about. Uh, some of it are um, direct observations that I've made in the field and interpreting those scientific things that we've learned. Um, there was a concern about wolves on Isle Royal um, basically going extinct as an indirect effect of climate change. So a big part of the book uh, focuses on that. Um, but, but really the, the theme throughout the book, the, the main character, if you will, throughout the book are the wolves of Isle Royal themselves. And uh, it, it uh, presents their lives as best as I can do on their terms. Um, and so you get to follow the lives of, of individual wolves uh, from day to day and month to month and, and literally generation to generation. And uh, so that's, um, you know, in a nutshell, that's what the that's what the book is about. And, and uh, there is a way in which merely telling the story uh, provides quite a bit of guidance about what counts as a good relationship with nature. John, just out of curiosity, like what, what drew you to wolves in the first place? I mean, and it couldn't have just been the fact that you found out what your name was. I mean, like, <laughs> like why these animals? Like what, what drew you to focus on, on these particular animals? You know, um, I have to tell you, uh, it was my relationship with wolves is entirely accidental. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I grew up in a suburb north of Detroit and I wanted to go to a university as far away from home, but still be in the same state because uh -huh. of the tuition. And so that was Michigan Technological University. Mm -hmm. Michigan Technological University has been the home of wolf moose research on Isle Royal mm -hmm. for a very long time. And so I started working on the project uh, uh, with my predecessor and mentor uh, when I was when I was 18 years old. And so mm -hmm. I was kind of founded accidentally. And, uh, and, and tr truth be told, I... I I'm, this sounds almost like a secret. I might like moose more than I like wolves. <laughs> but there's a, there's a reason why, because you can, it's hard to get to know wolves. They have, uh, they have lots of personality and they have a very complicated social life, which are really valuable ways to connect with wolves for sure. Cause we live our lives in similar ways, but you know, truthfully, when I see them, it's from an airplane and it's mm -hmm. far away. And there's all I hear is the sound of the, of the airplane. I don't hear right. their sounds. And, and, but a moose, um, especially on Isle Royal where they're not hunted, um, you know, some moose are not terribly afraid of people. And so you can, you can be 20 or 30 or 40 feet away from them and watch them mm, for long periods of time. Wow. And you can go find that moose the next day and watch them again. And, and, and you discover that moose actually have personalities and you can totally. in a little ways get to know one. And uh, so it, it, I, it, again, we talked about how it is that these animals are all uh, persons. Uh, I actually learned that from a moose long before I learned it from a wolf. Mm. So clearly, I mean, my takeaway here is that we were going to have you back on the podcast wearing a mask and have you be John Musichich. <laughs> right. I think that would be great. Literally. I think that'd be wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, great. This uh, again, thank you both so much. John Busetich, uh, PhD uh, professor at Michigan Technological University and Amanda White, program manager of wildlife protection at the Humane Society of the United States. That's all we have for today's show. To find out more about how we're fighting to protect wolves and end trophy hunting for good, head to humanesociety.org. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on Humane Voices. Humane Voices.